Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your Word brings light, giveth understanding. Somebody speak in other tongues. Prepare your spirit. Say something to God. Speak to God. Just say something to God. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 10. The Bible says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Let's read. One, two, let's go. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Somebody say, Amen. Give me the Amplified of the same. The Bible says, but by the grace, that is the unmerited favor and blessing of God, I am what I am. And this grace toward me was not found to be for nothing, fruitless and without effect. He says, in fact, I worked harder than all of them, the apostles, though it was not really I, but the grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of God which was with me. Somebody say amen. Paul says he received not the blessing, the grace of God in vain, without fruit, for nothing and without effect. Hallelujah, somebody. In other words, when Paul embraced the grace of God and the message, he had results. When Paul embraced the grace, the message, he had fruit. There are things that started to come out of his life and everybody would see that there is something about this guy who understood grace. Somebody say amen. Of course, I'm trying to go to a direction and place where many of us have received grace, have embraced the message of His grace, but we have failed to receive it fully in the understanding and revelation of that grace. And thereby now, we don't have fruit and we are without effect because we receive not the grace of God with purpose, with understanding and the revelation of it. Somebody shout amen. They are in this world people which receive the grace of God in vain. And there are also people which fail of the grace. Somebody say, Amen. Like in uh, Hebrews 12 verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, for who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright? Are you hearing me? One guy failed of the grace when he sold his birthright. Another guy receives the grace in vain. He receives it, but in vain. He takes the grace. He then fails of the grace like Esau. Amazing that the guy who fails of the grace, the Lord calls him a fornicator. <laughs> Some of your definitions are limited to what you think he is. Hello? And there's a guy here who fails of the grace of God and God calls him a what? A fornicator. The things of God are funny. Do you understand what I'm saying? But anyway, to the point. I have seen men which have failed of the grace and they've sold their birthright. In other words, they don't know what it means to be born again. But there are some who perhaps have received salvation and seem to know and understand what it means to be born again. But they don't act out the life of being born again. It's one thing to know. It's another to work out. Oh yes, I know. It is God that worketh in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. But it's another thing if he wants to work in your life and you don't give him the opportunity to. Because you don't understand the basic principles of the grace with which you received. Am I talking to somebody? Many, many times. 
I have seen people who say, oh, I'm under grace, I'm not under the law, oh, but they're bound. Hey, I'm blessed, I'm above and not beneath, I'm the head and not the tail, and you're telling all these things, but you're still failing in life. Oh, it's only a matter of time, I'll come out and some of people, it's a matter of time, but some of them, they are past time. The Bible speaks of Ephraim, who is an unwise son. For he tarries longer, where people what? In the place of breaking forth of children. He tarries longer. It's nine months he's supposed to bring out a child, but he's not bringing out a child. Then he goes to the tenth month. Have you seen how disappointing it is when you see certain people who look like they have potential, but their potential never becomes anything? You look at a guy, and when he starts preaching, you're like, my God, this guy in five years is going to be something. Or six years or seven years. And then you find them seven years later, and they're where they are. Some of us remember the time when we were in school. And then there were these very clever students, of which I was among. But you see, there were guys, <laughs> there were guys who looked promising. You remember that time? You look at a guy and like, my God, this guy is going to be rich. The way he thinks. The way he talks. You understand? Even the way he tucks in. Huh? It's as if he uses a rule and calculates the lines and then... You remember those boys who used to have very clean shoes, very nice cuts? And then you find the guy at 36 and he's high, you understand? He doesn't even have a job, he says, man, eh? cut, just cut me some 5K. And you're like, what happened to you? Uh, am I making sense? There are people who looked, there are women many years ago who looked marriable. But every year you're looking at them and they're like, huh? Oh. When I was in school, I'll never forget a certain day. There's this lady friend I was working with, and then she saw a certain girl, and she said, now, you see that girl over there? I, said, I looked at her, I said, yeah. That girl, in Luganda, she says, Mubiburunji. You know, at the level of her ugliness, it's good. Then she said, I wonder which guy will marry that kind of woman. Like the Bible says, when they were prophesying about Jesus, Mary kept these things in her heart. Even me, I kept that statement in my heart. And I remember very well after. The moment we graduated, they proposed to that dear lady. Who was ugly good. And I say the race is not to the swift. Neither the battle to the strong. Neither bread to the men of skill. But the woman knew time and chance. Now I reverse back and rewind. <laughs> I remove the thing I kept in my heart. This dear beautiful lady is still single. Don't worry, I'll not mention names. Praise God. Have you looked at people who look like they have the potential? And then tomorrow you're disappointed because, oh, they didn't make it. They failed of the grace. <laughs> Somebody shout Hallelujah. So I have seen men which fail of the grace. And I have seen men which have received grace but have taken it in vain. Somebody shout, Amen. The Bible says in First Peter chapter 4 verses 10, That as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace. When the gift of God is bestowed unto you, there is a way you ought to minister. In Colossians chapter 1, 28, he says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Jesus. And Paul says in the next verse, Where unto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And Paul says, ah, ah, the man, servant of God must not strive. Yes, there is a strife that is carnal, but there is a strife that is of God. Not all strife is carnal. Not all hard work is legal. Some people think, ah, that guy is working too hard. It's as if he's not under grace. Some people think, oh, when you receive grace, you just sit back. And then everything just comes because you are under grace. You want miracle money to fall from the sky without tithing. You're floating the principles of God because the man of God, Apostle Grace, will prophesy in your life. This guy ate fast fruit. He ate tithe. He ate everything. He got indebted. Police got him. Hello, Apostle. Speak a word. I told him, learn to tithe. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's so rude. No, 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 it's not rude. We want people to hold a certain level of accountability of the grace they've received. Don't think 
that you're going to be funny because you have received grace and everything is going to come on a silver plate because you have received grace. That is receiving it in vain. Paul said, I labored more than all my brethren. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Because the grace of God causes you to labor. It's divine enablement. Not passive abandonment. You don't sit back and say, oh, let everything work because I am under grace. No. The better. You have to work harder because you are under grace. The only difference is that you have the power of God working on you and you'll have extra results in your life. Why? Because you have allowed the grace of God to work in your spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. I know this is not popular, but I have to straighten a few people. Me and under grace. I can't do a job of 10,000 shillings. I refuse it. Okay. Stay under grace and sit back. Because you're so under grace. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Me, I can't do that. How can I? I'm a child of God. How can I sell Jesus? Me, a child of God. Okay, continue. Praise the Lord. The difference between a person of grace and somebody who's not of grace is simple. Even if you sell Jesus, you'll be a multimillionaire. That's the difference. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now we see young men who don't want to work. Why? Because they are under grace. Well, what are they waiting for? I wonder what they're waiting for. But there's something they're waiting for. They think something will just happen one day. And they touch under their chair. Okay. Because you're under grace. Christians who understand grace are supposed to be the hardest workers. Christians who understand grace are supposed to be the most committed people. People who understand grace are supposed to be the most exemplary. Wherever you are. He said you're the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. He has not wanted to make... He didn't want to make you a leader. And then... You're empty. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are principles that a man who has received grace must know. There are things I have learned over the years. And some we were not qualified to share then. And some we were qualified but the people we were ministering to were not able to receive. But now we're living in a dispensation where we are both qualified and men which we receive are ready to receive them. So even if this might be hard for some of you, I know you have the grace to take it. Somebody say Amen. Because we must bring sanity. Some of you think that because I've said, next year, I see God prosper you. You're just going to sit in your room like this. And then some random guy comes and throws a million dollars on your account. And then you say, wow, I'm prosperous. That is not how certain things are not going to come. God does not add on men which sit. He prunes them that produce fruit. That's what the Bible says. Get something you're doing. God will amaze you. He will, he will do things. He will shock you. But do something for yourself. Give God an opportunity to bless the works of your hands. If you do nothing with the works of your hands, what do you expect? You are a multimillionaire and you're thinking like a broke thing. You are a deep preacher. You are called to preach to the whole world, but you don't even read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't fast because you're under grace. You think that rain will just fall on your spirit and you preach. It can only fall for a while. After some time, you're going to minister falsehood. Why? Because you might be speaking truth. But not from the place that qualifies you. That's called the ministry of falsehood. That's when a man goes against the course. My pastors are not poor men. But they still go to work. And I worked too. Then you find a guy. He's broke. He's begging. He's beggarly. He, and then he's saying, me God called me to full time. What? what? Huh? God called you to full time. You can't even eat food. You're in full time ministry. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Go back and work. When you're in full time, the whole world will know. They are begging for fees. They are begging for everything. And the guy says, God called me for full time. Full time. For now, grew to more than 2,000 people and are still banking. What are you talking about full time? What do you mean by full time? You mean you're going to stay the whole day praying and every day fasting because God has called you full time. What are you doing from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. full time? You find somebody pastoring five members and he says, God called me to full time. <laughs> and then somebody, somebody just comes with a random madness. God told me to stop working. If he told you to stop working, <laughs> don't knock on a man's door <laughs> to ask for meat. That is abusing the grace of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say hallelujah again. 
there are things now I can teach. We knew them back, but we didn't teach them. Because the people we were talking to were not mature for them. But now you're mature. Now meat belongs to you. Who by reason of use have exercised their senses. Because every use has an experience. And so you have experienced and learned of Christ these things. If indeed you are born of Christ. Somebody say amen. Say amen again. Let me show you a few things. To qualify what I'm saying. Genesis chapter 25 verses 27. The Bible speaks of two boys in scripture. One was Esau, and he was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And there was Jacob, which was a plain man dwelling in tents. And as Jacob was a lazy fellow. But beforehand, God had spoken to the mother of his children. And he told her that in you two nations, what? Woe. And the, the Bible says there are two manner of people, and they shall be separated from thy bowels. And one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. It was prophesied that the elder shall serve the younger. It was no. So Esau comes out of his mother's womb when it's already ordained by God. That he was supposed to serve who? His younger brother Jacob. And it's true. So the Bible is clear that Esau was a field man. He was a hunter. He was a hard worker. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And the next verse says, and Isaac loved Esau. Why did he love Esau? Because Esau was a hard worker. Because he did eat of his venison. Did you hear that? And Rebekah loved Jacob. And God loved Jacob. He says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Are you hearing me? But the man hated by God and his mother was loved by his father. Why? Because he knew how to make venison for the father. Are you hearing me? Of course, we all know that the man sold his birthright and that was wrong. But almost everybody who speaks about Jacob only inclines to the man's selling of his birthright. They speak of his profanity. They speak of his fornication and that's true. But there's something on Esau people have not seen. And I want to say it to you today. He was not all bad. There was something about him too for you and I to learn. Many people have held and cling to the testimony of Jacob. But many of them don't understand that Esau had some to teach too. Because all they know is that he sold his birthright. Yes, he failed of the grace. That's true. But he also understood the principles of success. He understood the principles of success. And there are principles also that a man of grace also must understand. Because if you don't understand them, you're in trouble. Jacob is a lazy fellow. He sits in the back every time. While his brother is hunting, the guy is in tents. And that's okay. You'll dwell in tents and get a promise. And the promise will open doors for you. And you'll take birth rights and you'll become stronger than the other. But what about that moment when you know you're supposed to be stronger like God prophesied in your life. And the time comes out and you realize that the guy you're supposed to be stronger than is stronger than you. What happened, Jacob? Somebody say amen. So you remember the scripture very well. That a time comes when he tells his son, the guy he loves, and he tells him, go hunt for me, get a nice meal, cook me venison like I want it, and then come and I shall bless you. And Rebekah overheard, which was okay, because the work of Rebekah and Jacob was preordained. There was no way they were going to go against the course. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? So yes, he tells him, go uh, make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. And Rebecca overheard that the scriptures tell us. And when she overheard that, she goes to her boy and tells him, you know what, I heard your father tell the other guy that what? He's going to bless him. So they killed an animal. You remember the story very well? And the guy say, what if this guy discovers that I'm, I'm not Esau? And the mother tells the guy, let that curse fall on me. Rebecca knew how to cook the kind of meat Isaac loved. But there was only one other person who knew before, besides his wife. That was his son Esau. And that is exactly why he wanted to bless him. There was a principle in the spirit of Esau. And that's what caused, even though God had the choice over Jacob, that's what caused Isaac to love that boy. That's why he wanted to bless him. Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? 
Now we have a situation where Jacob comes. The voice is of Jacob, right? But the skin and smell is of what? Esau. And many people don't know, right? That Isaac blessed Jacob because he felt like a hard worker. Not because he was a hard worker. But because he felt like a hard worker. Are you hearing me? The voice was of a lazy man. But the flesh, the hands, were the hands of a hard worker. He smelled like a hard worker. And the guy blessed hard work. Now, because Jacob took the birthright, many claim Jacob taking the blessing and the descendants of Jacob, they protect that descendants of Jacob and they think that Esau's hard work was not counted. It was counted, sir. It was counted, sir. In other, let me tell you. Hannah woke up one day and told God, if you give me a son, I'll give him to you. She gave God that son and God took that son and used him. Are you hearing me? Now, some people think that because this guy felt like a hard worker, of course, grace will cause you to receive things hard workers have received. But grace is not telling you that because you have received things hard workers have received, therefore stay not working. And that's the mistake of our Christians today. They think you continue not working. Why? Because grace gives you things that people have not... No. Grace just gives you a head start. But if you play in the things, you're going to pay a price, brother. You don't need to clap now. But toward the end of service, you will clap. Grace gave me a head start. And that grace, after giving me a head start, was supposed to labor through me. He was not supposed to leave me there, irresponsible, sitting in the back and like sleepy bunny and freaky willy. And just sitting in the back because I received grace, therefore, let me allow, because once I received this, and then I received it again, and therefore that means let me just sit in the back. No. There's a difference between works and labors. Grace causes you to cease from your works, but it labors through you. And many people have received grace and they've exempted themselves both from labor and from work. And work is okay to resist, but don't excuse yourself from labor. You don't get the difference, do you? Praise the Lord Jesus. Somebody say amen. Say amen again. Let's go back to verses 38. 27, 38. Genesis 27, 38. And the Bible says, And Esau cried out and said unto his father, Has thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me even also, O my father. And Esau lifted his voice and wept. Why? Because Jacob had taken his word. Now the father knew that the blessing was on the boy. Who? Jacob. So he said, okay, for you, there is no blessing for you because you're not God's choice anyway. But I can bless the things around you. Because you're a hard worker. And the Bible says, and Isaac, his father, answered him and said, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. Let me bless the earth for you. And the dew of heaven from above. And number two says, And by the sword thou shalt live, and thou shalt serve thy brother. Are you hearing me? In other words, okay, I can't bless you because Jacob is a boy of grace. But hard work to will cause me to bless your dwellings. Your dwellings shall be of fatness, and your sword shall protect you. Sword means what? In other words, there's a certain word in your spirit. And then it tells him later, but listen, and it shall come to pass. Now listen to the scripture. He said, when thou shalt have dominion. I know you're not of God's choice. I know you're not the guy of the promise. But there's going to come a time when you will have dominion. There is a point where you'll break forth. And he says, and thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. There's a point you'll, where you'll outgrow his yoke. Why? Because there's a principle of a laborer in you. I know that he's originally God's choice. But if that boy sits and he does nothing, and you continue loving and serving the way you are, it's only a matter of time. Something will happen in your life to Esau that will overtake this boy who thinks that because of grace, he's supposed to be chilling in tents. Are you hearing me, child of God? 
I'm trying to remove the excuse people have to say that because I'm under grace, I'm not supposed to work, I'm not supposed to, to be a hard worker. Oh, no. Paul said, I labored more than all, yet not I, but the grace of God that labored in me abundantly. Otherwise, you have received it without fruit. And it's to nothingness. He told the guy, for you, it's when. It's not an if. Because when I see the way your patterns are, the way you've patterned your life, Esau, you might not be God's choice, but there's something on your life that one day will give you dominion over this sick fellow. And you'll have that yoke off your life. Because there's something I see in you. Why? You know how to cook venison the way I want it. The boy under grace is dwelling in tents. Let him continue dwelling in tents. There is a place for men who know how to cook venison. Some of you think that because God hated Esau, there was nothing for him. No. God, it's true, hated Esau. But he gave him what would make him a success. Some of you think that because you are born again, you are God's choice. The Arabs are supposed to be poor. No. He also loves them. And he also gave them something that they can do and become a success. Now you adopt what they know and add the grace and be a success. Because even the principles they do, they are biblical. I worked for an Indian guy who was a Hindu once. And he told me, my friend Grace... When you are working, never put the cart ahead of the, of the horse. He told me, always put the horse ahead of the cart. You'll be a successful man. Many people, when they're working, they always put the cart before the horse. Never put the cart before the horse. Put the horse before the cart. A guy is on supervisory level. They tell him there's an offer for you in a bank where you're going to become branch manager. That's two steps ahead of him. And then he asks them, how much are they paying you? The same money you were paid as a supervisor. No, I'm not going. Do you get what I'm saying? If you're clerkship level and you're working as a clerk and you're earning one million shillings, and then they tell you there's a branch managerial job in another bank and they're going to pay you 800,000. Brother, pack your bags and be a manager. Put the horse before the cart. Work hard. God knows how to increase you. The spirit of grace is there to make sure that he will create a certain connection when you're still at the, at the branch managerial level. And cause you to make a guy who will cause you to become a multi-million dollar entity. Then for you, many people say, how much are they paying me? They're even paying you less money. Ah, I'm not going for that job. Then he stays on a lower level. He owns the cart ahead of the horse. Listen, horses pull carts. Wisdom. Who says what? It's only a matter of time if you're a hard worker, you'll catch the attention of your boss. Understand how to make venison. I remember in the bank when I was banking, many guys said, ah, the branch manager likes you. We had a tough fellow who was for a branch manager. I pray he forgives me when he hears this someone one day. And I remember she'll tell you, people say, ah, the problem is that this guy loves you. He likes you. For you, he favors you. No. He didn't favor me. He was a tough fellow like all of us knew. But I knew how to make venison for him. I knew the man liked the kingly anointing higher. So I used to put a crown on him, give him a golden chair and a horse. But some of you, admit, the guy asks you to, to crown him. And then you say, who is he? Me, I'm a child of God. He's the one supposed to crown me. Why aren't you his boss? I'm under grace. I'm a child of God. I am the head and not the tail. Yes, you are the head and not the tail. But yes, God has to take you through process. That is why when Jacob inherits the promise, the mother tells him, go to your uncle Laban. What does Laban do? He makes the guy look after sheep. I'm a Jacob Because the boy was a tent dweller. And he thinks that he's going to be a success because he's received grace. No, the day he received blessing, he became a shepherd. <laughs> he left the tent 
God told him that even if you're under grace, there are principles that you cannot take away. Those principles are older than you. Your grandfathers did them. Your great-grandfathers did them. Every successful man in the world has done them, Jacob. You have to do them whether you want it or not. I know the blessing is on you, but you must understand how to serve a hard fellow. You must understand how Laban thinks. You must, you must submit yourself to Laban. The guy has an attitude. He's a thief. But serve the guy. They give him one, he says, okay, I'm working for Rachel. He works for Rachel seven years, and then they dupe him and give him another face like he did to his own brother. He didn't quit and say, because I'm a man of the blessing, I, I cast you, and then he walked away. No, no, no. He worked for another seven years. Fourteen years. Are you hearing me? Jacob thinks that because he has received grace, he's going to continue chilling in the what? In the tent. Faith takes the fellow under Laban. Tricks and the thief says, Piwa muya yap square. And he sits under the guy. Why? Because what he could not learn in the plains of field, God will take him to another man to learn. Either way, he has to learn. If you have a hot tempered boss and you know the guy flips off, you understand? Study the guy. Understand how he eats venison. He wants his work at 8. When you said do it 8 a.m., do it 8 a.m. If you promise him that you're going to give the work next day, give it. If you fail to give it, go to the guy and tell him, my master, Lord, I am so sorry that I couldn't deliver. Give me three hours, I'm going to deliver. A guy then not talk. He, he, he gives you a deadline of two days after. Are you hearing me? He says, I'm going to deliver your work in two days. He didn't deliver your work in two days. He didn't give you an explanation of why he didn't deliver your work in two days. And he's under grace. Then you come to the guy and tell him, why didn't you deliver in two days? And say, don't you see I was, I was busy? You think it is easy? Okay, you do it yourself. You will not boss, boss me around. Who are you? And that attitude is in tongue speaking guys who are under grace. Because they are children of God. They are the head and not the tail. Who are you to talk to me that way? Listen, he has not given your leaders. The Bible says the road for nothing. They will lash you and God will say you deserve the judgment, brother. They are firing young boys for not working hard. And they are saying, me, I'm not under the, I'm under grace. They are firing, you're not, you're not supposed to be fired. You're supposed to quit. It is not the will of God for you to be fired. It is the will of God for you to quit. It's one thing to be ready to die and another for death to, 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 to rob you. And then they fire the guy and then he fails for another three years. And then he says, all of this is the will of God. It's not. You're not a performer. You ask, I worked with the bank, they'll tell you. The guy, I knew this guy. For example, I studied this guy and realized that sometimes he has deals in the evening. I understood evening was venison for him. And he used to have the bank keys with one of our other guys. And you know what I did? I used to tell him, Master, just give me the keys, I'll lock for you. The guy goes. And then I sit in the bank. Just to wait to make sure everyone has worked. Everybody has switched off the computers. I go walking around to make sure we've not spoiled electricity. We don't waste it because we are bankers. Ta, 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 ta. I make sure the printers are off, you understand? I make sure the alarm is set and I lock the door. And I get on a board, a board and get back home. This guy loves you. Of course he has to love me. I care the time my master leaves. Wives. You, the, the man comes back and you tell him, your food is in the fridge. Warm it. No. No. Daddy, Daddy, kachai ko chambugumie mu oba karesebo. Daddy, yo mazo kulie mere wamiye. Daddy, daddy nzijewo oba nko ongere. Na muli ndako. They call it kuli ndako. Our mothers waited for our fathers to eat before they went to bed. Dot com generations. Your food is in the microwave. Then she goes to sleep. My marriage is not working. I'm under grace. I refuse that spirit that attacks demons of marriage. No! It's not... There is no demon. There is no demon. If your husband comes back home and then you serve him food, wait for him to eat. Ask him, my master, how is he feeling? 
Do you need more salt? Let me get it right away. You don't like it? The meat is harder. I'll make it softer for you next time. How do you want it? Can I warm it for you? Do you want me to microwave it? How, how many minutes do you want it? Sit there and watch the guy eat. And then after get the plate away and take it back in the home. And then tell me whether he will cheat on you. Jacob. Are you hearing me? But you're raised with a nasty attitude. You can't talk to me like that. Michael, you can't talk to me like that. Who are you talking to? You think I'm young? No, no, listen. Listen. It's not for women to answer. Eh, eh, eh? What are you talking about? You mean the guy will just lash at me and keep quiet? If you have a God, yes. If you have a God, yes. When Sarah told Abraham to get rid of Hagar and Hagar and Abraham refused, the devil didn't sell us and Sarah told Abraham, who do you think you are? You think I'm not of the promise? When God was speaking to you, did you speak to me to know? Sarah just went to the God. She knows. And she told him, buddy, your son is messing me up. The next day, we see the man against his will, saddling the donkey and telling Hagar, you know what, Hagar, I love Ishmael, but that woman knows God. Hallelujah, somebody. Principles. Was Sarah under grace? Yes. But she knew how to do it. And you must know how to do it. You must know how to do it. You must know how. So, Jacob, let me tell you. Esau, let me show you something in Genesis 28, verse 6. Esau loved his father so much. Eh? Let me show you something about Esau. Esau loved, I read this thing, it, it made me laugh. One time, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram and to take him away from thence. And that he, as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father, the Bible says he went and to Ishmael and took the wives of the sons of Ishmael. Why? Because he knew his father didn't like the wife. The women of, of what? Padan Aram, right? I think there was something around them. They were their own, it's true. But there was something funny. But when Esau realized his father didn't love this woman, he didn't waste time. So he said, what my father didn't love? Huh? But he told him, for you it's a when. It's not an if. One day, you'll go over this guy. Because there is something he doesn't click. God says, okay. Even this guy of grace. Let me help him understand. That it's not just enough to receive grace. Let me, let, let me also put him through tests. He brought Jacob a Laban. Are you hearing me? And when you see how Jacob served Laban. He served Laban with grace. But also he learned the principles of success. For those of you who are serving at your workplace. For those of you who are serving in ministry, wherever you're serving, you must understand the principles. Let me show you something. One time, Jacob escapes, you remember? With his family and children and everything. And then Laban gets to learn of it. And Laban chases after him. Laban's problem is one thing. Number one, they've stolen one of his gods. But number two, most importantly, why did he leave without saying what? Goodbye. He told him, my sons and daughters are all my children. How do you leave my children without saying bye? That is wrong of you. You would have told me bye. And Jacob told him, I feared you might also take them away from me because you're a thief. So he didn't bless, blame Jacob over that. But when Jacob was angry, he made a statement. And that statement qualifies the principles of his service toward Laban. The things everybody should know when you're serving a man of God... Or when you're serving at your workplace. Because even your job is ordained by God. Somebody say amen. In Genesis 31 verses 38. The Bible says, give me the New Living Translation. I feel it's better in the New Living Translation, if you have it. The New Living Translation says, uh -huh. Listen to Jacob telling who? Laban. He told him, for 20 years I have been with you. Caring for your flocks. Are you hearing me? 
in all that time, your sheep and goats never, mis- never miscarried. That's a man of grace. When you look after a man's sheep, the grace of God will make sure that no sheep miscarries. No sheep what? Miscarries. That's blessing. In other words, because you're in that business, it won't fail. It doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard. It only means because you're in that business. When you receive grace, that business cannot fail. Are you listening to me? And he told him, in all those years, I never used a single ram of yours for food. In other words, you don't cheat your boss and then you go past your salary and then start selling extra things without the permission of your boss to make his rams for your food. If you're serving a man of God, you don't take advantage of his sheep for food. And I see pastors do that in certain ministries. You're serving in a certain ministry, but even as a pastor in that ministry, you're reaching some other man of God's sheep and you're telling them, can you give me transport? Can you give me fuel? That is unfaithful. These men know, and everybody in here can bear me witness, I have never begged any man of money. Those who bless me, bless me because the Lord told them. But I have never begged of any man. When I was serving a man of God, I never begged his sheep of money. And the Lord is my witness. How dare you do it in my ministry? Full time. If God called you for full time, why are you telling people to buy you fuel? Next verse. Listen. If any, listen. If any were attacked and killed by wild animals, he said, I never showed you the carcass and asked you to reduce the count of your flock. No, I took the loss myself. Why? Because I'm responsible. Are you hearing me? And you made me pay for every stolen animal, whether it was taken in broad daylight or in the dark. Some of you have banked, you know what I'm talking about. How many of you are bankers? You've ever been a banker? And for example, you've worked in a till. Remember those days you'd balance your books and you find a loss? And now they have to declare who get from your money. <laughs> you remember those days? Because you can't tell your boss that 10000 is missing from my pocket. Sometimes you'd find yourself getting that money and putting it in so that you close the day. Yes, you've reduced your pay. It's true you didn't steal that money, but it's part of it. Then a guy is in a ministry and then he's in charge of lights. And then one bulb buys, dries out. Then he comes and then he reports uh, accounts. One bulb is out. How much is it? 6,000. And he wants to be a success in this life. If you have the 6,000, buy the bulb. Don't bother the accounts lady. Grace. <laughs> Next verse. And he says, I walked for you through the scorching heat of the day and through the cold of sleepless night. A man under grace is walking in scotless heat and days of nights and sleepless nights in the cold. Rain is hitting him. He's under grace, but rain is hitting him. And the sun is hitting at him too. The dust is hitting his legs. Why? Because he has to walk and work hard. Yes, a man under the promise. Yes. Oh, me, I'm under grace. I just sit in my bed. And everything comes. I rebuke you again in the name of Jesus. Next verse. And yes, for 20 years, I slaved in your house. And I worked for 14 years earning your two daughters. And then six more years for your flock. And you changed my wages ten times. So God realizes, okay, Jacob has gotten it too. It's not just about receiving grace. It involves you to engage yourself to in something to do. Let me tell you. We have grace to heal the sick and cast out devils. But that doesn't mean that we sit in the back and just wait for the message to come and fall. No. We set ourselves apart too. We fast and pray more than even many of you. I fast more than many of you. I speak in tongues more than many of you. When many of you are sleeping, we are up in the night meditating to preach to you on Thursday while you're just snoring. One time I was somewhere after a meeting, a little boy came to me and told me, Apostle Grace, pray for me. I want sevenfold of your anointing. (laughs) 
I just prayed for the boy and said, God, more grace. He just needs more grace. He didn't need sevenfold of my anointing. Sevenfold. <laughs> sevenfold. Do you even know what's upon me? For you to count sevenfold, do you know what's upon me? And now you're taking us in the law. I'm not taking you in the law. I'm not taking you in the law. Jacob was not under the law. Neither is so. That was before the law came. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to take away some noses I'm starting to see in our generation where people are not responsible, they're not accountable, they're not hard workers anymore. More because they receive grace. They're the worst workers at their jobs. They're the, the, the a person one time approached me with a multi-million dollar deal and told me, I need you to get me somebody to do something. There was somebody I had in mind, but I could not mention the name. I couldn't because I knew, I knew even though the guy has every qualification to get this multi-millionaire deal to work for this fellow. There is something on his character that just can't make it and he will ashamed the gospel. Now people are turning to non-believers because those guys keep time. They are professional. They are hard workers. When he commits and he says that I'm going to deliver your work on Thursday, he delivers it on Thursday at 8 a.m. Yes, it's on your table. Then a born again guy wastes time two weeks later. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't deliver your work because he's under grace. And then he raises his hands. I receive, I receive money in the dollars in the name of Jesus. Seest thou a man diligent in his work? For that man shall stand before kings and not before mean men. Diligence is a principle. We can't hire Christians anymore. Because they don't have any, you know, and, and it's worse when somebody has a sense of entitlement. Do you know there are people in this world who think they must be helped? Do you know there are people who think, eh? You must help them. You understand what I'm saying? We have people like that. Even in your families, you have people who think it's a must for you to give him. Oh, huh? if you don't give him, you're not his brother. If you don't help him, you're not his sister. How can you not help because they think you're going to go past the principles of Almighty God and bless them in their tents. For such if I just tell them, come and I'll give you a job and I'll pay you. And they will not come. Because the guy wants you. You know, have you ever been around kids who are like last bones? Now they have an uncle in America. They have another one in Netherlands. They have a sister in Russia. Then another one in, in, in London. And then she said, oh, sister in London. Then they send like 200 pounds. And then, oh, sister in uh, Germany. Then they send him like 300 euros. Oh, my cousin in America, you know. And then they send him. And then if the guy walks in Kampala, large like this. On people's money, which they've sweated for. They are working two jobs, night shifts and day. And then they send the fellow money. And then the guy just starts joking around. Why? Because his father, his brother, he has a brother and a cousin sister abroad who sent for him money. And the day they don't send for him, those are not my brothers. I don't have a family. Never talk to me again. He even changes his WhatsApp. He throws a tantrum. Why? Because you didn't help him when you were supposed to help him. Where is his helper? My help, my help, my help, all of my help comes from my cousin in America. Oh. God is your helper. If they don't help you, that's okay. Don't cut a wire. Say, God, one day I'm the one who will help them. Work hard. Some people are entitled. Listen. Nobody in this world owes you anything. Can I say it again? Not even your father. Not even your mother. Nobody owes you when you become born again. A boy is in his father's house, but he's looking at the father's inheritance. Cafe. Cafe Murageko. You know I'm my father's first heir, so you see that land? Yeah, it's mine. You see, you see our father. You understand? 
the father is rich and he starts walking like a rich person because the father is rich. No! No, no, no. No, sir. It's not your what? Munziremu, it's not your what? It's not your money. Work hard. My father is my witness. One time I told him, Mr. Matofuwali, Namugamba, Kanchokini Namuruga, Nachiza Mruzungu. Namugamba, Nachiza Mruzungu. Namugamba, Nachiza Mruzungu. Namugamba, Nachiza Mruzungu. Namugamba, Nachiza Mruzungu. I told him, I don't want your inheritance. You just bless me. Speak a word of my, my life as my father. It shall be enough. And I went down on my knees and he blessed me in the living room with my little sister Maureen. I remember that day. And from that day, my finances were released. All I needed was his blessing. I didn't need his inheritance. I needed his blessing. That's all you need from a man of God. That's all you need. The blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. You don't need your cousin in America to send you money. Nobody owes you. Tell your neighbor, nobody owes you. He didn't create you. God did. All you need is your parents' blessing to say, I bless you. That is enough. Some of you, you have grieved your parents. They can't even talk to you. You're not even talking. If he dies, he dies. No. Go to your father and make peace and kneel down. Some of you are struggling because you grieved your fathers. Go to your father and make peace. Even in ministry, I didn't leave. I served the man of God up to the last day and I went down on my knees and he blessed me. And I left with that blessing. And there's nothing in the world anybody can do. Why? Because I had to serve to the last. Some of you just... Principle. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, principle. So now a time comes when Jacob has to meet his brother, Esau. And he knows I'm in trouble. Are you hearing me? He says, I'm in what? Genesis 32 verses 13. The Bible says, He lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand, a present for Esau, his brother. Why? Because he was going to meet his brother. So he started carrying gifts for him. But what was in the brain of Jacob was, it seems that I have, I think in Jacob's mind, what he was thinking was, God bless me, Esau is suffering. Are you hearing me? So let me take something for him such that I can share. And he forgives me. So he lost there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present of Esau. Uh, he says 200 she goats, 20 he goats. 200 eels, 20 rams. Now there's a principle there also. If you give our animals, why are the female more than... Ah. So the Bible says, next verse. 30 milch camels with their colts, 40 kin and 10 bulls, 20 shears, asses, and 10 foals. And the Bible says, and he delivered them into the hand of his servant, his servant, sorry, every drove by themselves. And he said unto his servants, listen, pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. In other words, put groups of animals in order, right? Are you following? And the Bible says, and he commanded the former saying, when Esau, my brother, meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou? Right? And whither goest thou? And whose are these before thee? In other words, he expected that when Esau, Esau was coming with 400 men. He had 400 guys. I don't think Jacob had 400 people. I don't think Jacob left Laban with 400. But Esau had 400 what? In fact, if you look at the inheritance of the lineage of Esau, it's where the birth of dukes comes from. Read the definition of dukes. For those of you who don't know, duke. Right? The word duke. Go and read it. Dukes come from the lineage of Esau. Now, he tells him, when Esau comes, he'll ask, whose are you? Huh? Where are you going? And whose are these? He'll ask about these animals. So put animals, because he must be attracted to the animals anyway. He has to ask about these animals. And then he has to ask you where you are, come from. And he has to ask you whose servants you are. And the next verse says, And then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. Now, Jacob is a servant of Esau. The man who is blessed. And who has the birthright. Now, 
He is a servant. Of who? And behold also, he's behind us. Right? And the next verse says, And so commanded he the second and third, and all that followed the drop, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau, when you what? When you find him. Let's skip because of time. Let's go to chapter 33, verses 4. When they finally meet, I want you to see Esau's meeting and Jacob's meeting. Right? Esau ran to meet his brother. He embraced Jacob and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Okay? And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? He first asked about people, not animals. Because animals was none of his business. Yet that is what Jacob put ahead. Jacob put animals ahead because he was thinking he's the wealthy one because of the blessing. This guy asked about children first. He says, the children which God has graciously given, thy servant. And the next verse, and then the handmaids came nearer, and they that their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after that, Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And the last verse says, and he said, what meanest by all this drove which I met? That was the last thing he asked. What do you mean by the animals I saw? Are you hearing me? And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Now is his Lord. In fact, if you read the scriptures before, Jacob bowed seven times before he met Esau. The number seven means completely submitted. When thou shalt have dominion, not if, when thou, it's a matter of time, you'll take over. Now, the next verse says, and he said, what meanest thou by all these drugs which have met? And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau told the guy, I have enough, my brother. Keep the thou and to yourself. I have. You, eh, you thought because God bless you, you're the one who can have. No. There are principles I did. I went over. Keep your stuff. He told him, keep your stuff. Oh, so you thought that because you're a man of the blessing, and me, I'm not blessed, therefore, you're going to have to find me poor. So you give me animals to make peace with me. Brother, I'm blessed too. There is another way also that you don't know. And that same way have put us here together. Where I'm your Lord now and you're my servant. Even though you're the man of the promise. The next verse says, And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at hand. For therefore have I seen thy face. Listen, as though I have seen the face of God. Do you know what it means for a man to say, I've seen your face and it looks like the face of God? It means that there is something that happened on Esau's countenance. And it started to look like God. In other words, he attracted the anointing. Yet he was not the man of the blessing. But the anointing of God was evident on his life. And the man of the grace and promise and blessing is qualifying it that I see the face of God on you. And the next verse says, And thou was pleased. He says, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough, and he urged me, and he took it. And he said, Let us take our journey. You know, yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah, okay. Animals, yeah, yeah, let's go. They made peace. Are you hearing me? Years later, Jacob is old. He leaves descendants of the like. Are you hearing me? And there's something Jacob never told his boys. Even though he was a man of the blessing and promise, there is something he never taught his boys. Why would they kill their own brother? Why would they want to destroy their own brother? Are you hearing me? Do you understand what I'm saying? There is something he didn't put in them. That's why when the famine was hitting, there is no son who could sense it. The guy who could, they threw out. They didn't even know how to honor the anointing. On their father and the boy the Lord had chosen, which was Joseph. There was something the boys never knew. Long and short, they go to Egypt. They become slaves. The sons and daughters of Jacob, the man of the promise and blessing, goes into slavery. And the sons of Esau dwell in Mount Seir in peace. And God told him, thine dwelling shall be of fatness. And you shall eat of the dew. I have blessed the land where you are. I know that you're not the Lord's blessed, but I'll bless the land where you are. Wherever you'll be, it shall be fatness. 
and you shall eat of the dew of heaven from above. These guys go to Egypt. The sons and daughters of Jacob, they are enslaved. After slavery, all of you know the story, when they cross the Red Sea and then come, they go to Mount Seir, the inheritance of the Edomites, the sons of Esau, and they dwelt there 38 years. Because when they moved to Mount Seir, it was the most fertile place. It had fatness. It looked blessed. They would not have lived there if it didn't look like United States of America or Canada or London. <laughs> now here people who say, ah, if you go to London, ah, your life is... <laughs> Some pastor one time said, America is the second heaven. Zion is heaven. Not America. It's not where you are. It's who you're with. You know, I told people, let them, you see, there was a time I asked for three years and we met the third year. Give us another two. We are going to stay in Uganda until it becomes a first world nation. And quicker than you think. Go to America, it's okay. But even in America, you better produce results. Don't think that because you have the grace of America, Jacob, that because you're in America, everything will work. Boys are begging food in America. And they went there for a living. And people are building mansions in Uganda. Come on somebody. In Ugandan shillings. It's not where you are. Are you hearing me? 38 years. When they reached Mount Seir. The Bible is clear. They forgot about the promise. Because they didn't even know how to live in the promise anymore. God had to come to them and tell them, you've been around this mountain for so long. Move! 38 years of the 40 years in the wilderness. They were in Mount Seir. That means Mount Seir was the most successful and devout part in the wilderness. It was the only habitable place. It had fatness in the wilderness. Esau had fatness in the wilderness. They get to the end, they enter the promised land, only but a few men, because there was another spirit in them, which was not like in Joshua and Caleb. They enter the promised land, and they die there, without inheriting the promises of God. And after that, you see, the children of the Edomites in Seir still become successful, to this day. Oh, I'm under grace, I'm under grace. Yes, you're under grace. Yes, you're under grace. Yes, you're under grace. But Esau has some to teach you. Raise your hands and speak in other tongues. Now, in such a, a teaching, eh, you have to talk to God according to the state of your heart. If you've been playing in things, eh? <laughs> if you've been playing in the things of God, this is a time God has to deliver you. Some of you think, because you have a man of God, he will speak in your life and everything will change. Some of you have received testimonies, you have received prophecies, and you're dying with those prophecies. Nothing has changed. You examine yourself how many words were spoken on your life, which were even spot on. Even as they told us, you'll go to nations, you'll handle money in euros, in dollars, and in pounds. Yes, they did. But we didn't expect that because they spoke that we're just supposed to sit back. No. We pray. We read the word. We give ourselves holy. We meditate. We speak in tongues. We create our world. Are you hearing me? We do the things. We, we preach the gospel. When it's hot, when it's cold, when it's dark and when it's day. We're in the country today. You're flying out three days and tomorrow morning you're going to preach. You understand what I'm saying? I remember my first years before I started Fanero. I've been preaching almost every day of my life. And up to today, I preach almost every day of my life. Sometimes I go to bed at midnight. Sometimes it's 1 a.m. Sometimes it's 2 a.m. I'm not singing. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm not eating ice cream. No. But I know even the Lord who keeps me up at night meditating and praying, even for you, He does it through me by His grace. Don't take the grace of God in vain. Young people, get jobs. Even if you're earning 50,000, the Lord knows you. He will increase you. He'll multiply you. Work harder at your job. 
Be the best there is. Be promoted every year. Have a story to tell your children. When a time comes for you to quit, they'll say, my mother was one of the hardest workers. I worked in the bank and I'm happy. I finished my course and I don't regret any other part of the way. Because even the time I finished, I was one of the greatest performers. And I knew that I was a performer. And I finished well as a performer. And, and I can tell my children proudly. I even printed out my performance before I left the bank. So that when my children questioned, I showed them and I told them, your father was a performer. In campus, we excelled. Because we needed to show men that we were excellent in books. Are you hearing me? We were among the best students in school. And after that, we worked so hard. And after that, we were preaching the gospel. So that people look at you and say, Oh, he did not receive the grace of God in vain. Work harder. Work harder. Because you have grace. Pray harder. Because you have grace. Believe harder. Because you have grace. Commit yourself harder because you have grace. Fulfill all righteousness. Professionalism is professionalism. If you're supposed to reach your workplace at 8, make it at 8. If you have an appointment at midday, reach at 11.15 or 45. Say that you're there for that appointment. Honor your word. Keep your place and keep your heart. Those are the three things that qualify the integrity of spirit. No man understands those three things that is not diligent. And no man is diligent and they're not a success. These words are able to make you wise unto salvation. The difference is you'll have grace to give you head starts. But don't abuse that head start, Jacob. Otherwise, you'll wake up tomorrow and the man which was supposed to be your servant, you are his servant. The man which he was supposed to call you Lord is your Lord. That's why with Isaac, he told his son, when thou shall have dominion. Because I know a point will come when you become a success. Why? You know how to cook for me venison. Men of God who serve men of God. Know how to serve your man of God. Know how he eats his venison. Premeditate his ministry and understand what he likes and do it prior. I served a man of God. I studied him. I knew his waist size. I knew his shoe size. I knew his favorite food. I knew how he thought. I knew when he's mad. I knew when I knew. When you're at your workplace, study your boss. If you know she's a hot tempered head, understand. If she wants king, queen, she, you understand. Don't be queen. Are you hearing me? Give her her crown and her magic wand stick and let her rule. It's only a matter of time they'll ask, who do you think can fit in your position? Oh, God anointed me to be king. So David says, Saul is not God's choice. That guy is supposed to be fallen. No, the same guy gets the harp and he plays it for a man tormented by devils because he knows it's the only way he can become king in the office. He kills 10,000 men. And after killing them, he didn't come out saying, I killed 10,000. No, it's the people who scream. David never screamed. Lions don't scream after a kill. They don't roar after a kill. Lions don't roar after a kill. Wah, you see me. I'm the one who did this. No, you don't boast. Work hard. And after working hard, don't blow your whistle. Just continue no more. And act like everything is okay. There are people who will observe your hard work and commitment. And they will promote you. They will bless you. Some guy has been seated in the same office for 20 years. This guy is doing the same position. No promotion in his life. Oh, me I'm under grace. No, no, listen. Maybe, just maybe, you floated the very principles. There was a time people used to bark at my boss. Eh? Because the guy was tough. Some guys would throw tantrum to who do you think? Ah, the Lord is my witness. And I thank God for Mr. Paul Romato. He told me, Never answer your boss. Never. Even if he has screamed like how ne I never answered that man ever in public. I never. You don't answer your boss. You don't talk to your boss a certain way because they flipped you. 
They didn't annoy you. No. The situation just showed how much annoyed you can be. I don't know whether you get the difference. It just brought out the real character. It's not them who brought it in you. It was there. It just needed the right atmosphere. But get to a point where even if the atmosphere is the worst, you can still hold your thing. Back in the day in African tradition, women used to go to witch doctors. And then they tell, she tells my husband quarrels and then he beats me. Then a witch doctor gives her a stone. I tell her, put this under your tongue when he starts quarreling. And then she puts that stone under the tongue. Mm, like this. And she thinks that it's the magic working. No. She's shutting up. And she's not talking. And then the guy quarrels with a woman who's not answering. And he says, ah, let me leave this woman alone. I'm quarreling, but she doesn't answer back. And then she comes back and says, man, the medicine you gave me worked. The guy doesn't quarrel anymore. No, he just shut you up. I'm a pastor. But the people who have talked to us like we are their peers. And I've heard them. And sometimes I'm like, okay. They talked to the anointed. I never talk to men of God a certain way. Even if I don't agree with them. There are men of God I don't agree with. But I can never dress them a certain way. I can never disrespect them because I don't agree with them or because they hurt me. Even if he had to keep quiet. Let them say you say it. But let them never quote you. Let them never have a text message or have nothing recorded of you. Yes, there are people who say you say it. Even if you didn't say anything. And there are rumors which will never move around you. But let your conscience be clear before God. That I say nothing. Men of God love to scare. The Bible says even when he was reviled, our Jesus, when he was reviled, he reviled not back, neither answered them with threatenings. Oh, you talk to me that way. You're going to see. I'm an anointed man. God is going to curse you. You're a baby. That's who you are. You're a babe. You don't need to tell a man what is going to befall him. No. You know who you stand before. Vengeance is of the Lord. If these things abide in you, the Bible says you shall be fruitful and have good success. Hallelujah. Now speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. Take me. Mold me.
raise your hands and I want to speak to you right now. And I also want to tell somebody here, if you're listening to me, more so if you've submitted to Apostle Grace Luega. Get some to do for God and do it so good. All of us are called to be ministers. You might not be on the pulpit. But get something and do it so good. If you hear an instruction from the altar and they tell you do this, do the instruction of the altar. Dominion will come. Project Unchurched, reach out to those ten. Reach out to the lost. Give, pray, forgive, let go, serve. But wherever you are, take God serious. He'll take you serious. Now, by reason of the anointing upon my life, I commit you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to keep you and to give you an inheritance among us them which are sanctified. If you have not been walking according to this pattern and course, you are forgiven by God. But I declare and I declare that from today, a better you comes out. That you are going to register results in your ministries, wherever you are, in your jobs, in your workplace, in your marriage. The things that make us who we are. And you are laboring more than all them, yet not you. But the grace of God that labors in you mightily. I want you to give the Lord God a mighty hand clap of praise. Clap for Jesus like something happened. Hallelujah. If you're sick, I want you to touch where it's paining right now. I'm releasing healing. Abnormal growths are disappearing right now. Just receive it. I see somebody, you've been blind in one eye. The right eye, God is opening it right now. Deafness in the ear is opening, is healing. Right now his ears are opening. You're here and you need a job. I declare upon your life that God gives you a job in the name of Jesus. For some of you have been believing God for promotions, the Lord promotes you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you. I see promotions coming upon you guys. Great promotions. Some of you, your diligence is about to pay. remember the time I told you that this week some of you are going to receive crazy, crazy gifts. Somebody received the car immediately that day. How many of you received gifts that week that were crazy? Land, houses, things like that. Put up your hand straight. Straight. You see? There are more than a hundred people. Take the word of God serious. Why does it work for one and not work for another? Hallelujah. Now I decree promotions upon your life. At your job, those of you are businessmen, your business is going to increase. You're going to meet people with multi-million dollar ideas and they're going to work. Your paperwork are going to be signed in the name of Jesus. I declare and I declare that you're a success in everything. Somebody with a breaking marriage, it's going to work. Believe him. I want to pronounce a blessing upon your lives. I want to decree that things are going to come easy for you and he'll give you the grace to labor more than all because grace is available for you. I declare and I declare that the men at the sound of my voice are going to be some of the most su- they're going to be some of the most successful people the world has ever seen. Some of you this evening you've entered something. It's like a glory. Power of the Holy Ghost. Some of you you've entered it's like a glory upon your life. Something is shed on your face and on your spirit and favor is going to start following you. Wherever there was rejection, in the name of Jesus, there is acceptance by the Holy Ghost. Favor is on your life in the name of Jesus. I declare and I declare that you receive favor even from uncommon places. Some of you, the people that hated you most, are going to start favoring you. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Job opportunities are going to fall vacant for you. And some of you, you're going to enter things you're not qualified of. Not by power, not by might, but by His Spirit. It's an anointing, I told you. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus like you received something this evening. Thank you, Lord.
Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, come now. Come now. It is the best decision you could ever make for your life. Come now and stand there. Somebody, come. Are you ready to receive Jesus? Repeat these words after me. Put up your hands. Say, Jesus, tonight I believe that you died and rose again. Tonight I believe you are the Son of God that gave himself for me. Tonight I confess you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.